Good morning and welcome to this morning's reflection. Today I'm looking at the life of St Dunstan, who died on May the 19th in the year 988, just three days after preaching three times on Ascension Day in Canterbury Cathedral. Dunstan was born near Glastonbury in Somerset around 909 to a noble family with royal connections and he was a nephew of Athelm, Archbishop of Canterbury. After leaving school, he joined his uncle's household before moving on to the royal court. But in 935, he was expelled from court for allegedly practising witchcraft and black magic. He considered marriage at this stage, but instead made monastic vows and after some deliberation was ordained and became a hermit at Glastonbury. There he became proficient at painting, needlework and metalwork. His fortunes changed again in 939 when the new King Edmund of Wessex recalled him to court and installed him as abbot of, uh, of Glastonbury. Encouraged by the king, Dunstan reformed the abbey under the rule of St Benedict, attracting new disciples and enlarging the buildings. And from then on, monastic life was maintained in England without disruption until the dissolution, more than five centuries later. He spent some years as, as abbot, but in 955 Dunstan was forced into exile by his enemies at court and fled to a monastery in Flanders. His exile didn't last long, however, and two or three years later he returned to England where he was made bishop of both Worcester and London by King Edward and finally Archbishop of Canterbury in 960. This was the start of a fruitful collaboration between the King and Dunstan and in later years was looked back on as a golden age within the English church. New monasteries were built at places such as Peterborough and Ely and important features of these established establishments included close dependence on the king for protection, liturgical additions such as prayers for the royal family and an insistence on the importance of the scriptorium and workshops. In the wider church he insisted on proper observance of the marriage laws and fasting. He built and repaired churches ordered the payment of tithes and brought in heavy fines for non-payment of church taxes. In addition, every priest had to practice some kind of handicraft in order to teach parishioners a skill as well as the faith. After the death of King Edward in 978, Dunstan's public career as royal advisor declined and he retired to Canterbury where he taught at the cathedral school and corrected manuscripts as well as continuing to administer justice. He seems to have been extremely influential in both state and church affairs, held in high esteem by all and was, as a result, soon accepted as a saint after his death. He was canonised in 1029 and remained England's most popular saint for almost two centuries until the death of Thomas a Becket. It's been said that the 10th century gave shape to English history and Dunstan gave shape to the 10th century. 
Dunstan was obviously a very gifted and talented man, with some biographies also describing him as a musician. So it's not surprising he's known as the patron saint of goldsmiths, jewellers and locksmiths. And today's reading from Exodus chapter 31 is particularly apt. The Lord spoke to Moses. See, I have called by name Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with divine spirit, with ability, intelligence and knowledge in every kind of craft, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver and bronze, in cutting stones for setting and in carving wood, in every kind of craft. Let us give thanks for Dunstan and his skills and those of others like him who produced wonderful illuminated manuscripts and worked precious metals into objects of beauty for church use. To end, I've chosen the hymn Alleluia, Alleluia, hearts to heaven and voices raise. Oh,